Hello everyone, Robert Blackheart. Today I'm going to be presenting a workshop on using GitHub for CI CD, which is also known as continuous integration and continuous delivery. If you have any questions after the, viewing this workshop, please feel free to reach out to ng-ywit-questions at netapp.com. Uh, that's the same link you'll see at the bottom of the website where it says contact us. And be sure to mention your email, the name of the workshop, and I'll try to get back to you with any answers I have. So what are GitHub Actions? GitHub Actions allow you to automate tasks within your normal software development cycle, right? So if you're, you already own a, a, a GitHub repository, right? And you put code there for a project or you're helping out somebody else's project, uh, and you want to automate some of the tasks that you have, right? So, you know, there's certain things you would do. Um, you need to have your code built. Uh, maybe, you know, you generate some executable from your library or from your repository, or maybe you need to run um, some checkers on it. You want to make sure that, you know, everybody's following the same style guide or uh, uh, you that things are just looking the way you want it to look. Uh, maybe you need to uh, publish documents or um, even automate some of the, the the tasks you need to do when a pull request comes in, right? Maybe somebody says here, uh, I want to contribute this fix. Does it look good to you? And some of the things you need to, you know, do the same thing there where you want to check the style for them or uh, make sure they're passing the unit test, et cetera. So GitHub Actions allow you to automate some of these processes. And what, by doing it uh, in an automated way, you can do it on every commit, every pull request. And that takes uh, some of the, the opportunity for your code base to get broken out. So we look at the, the GitHub official docs. There's a lot of information about GitHub Actions. Um, Today, I'm just going to show you a very small practical example. Um, it will help you get started and get, give you an idea of what you can use it for, but it's by no means comprehensive. And I encourage everybody to, to look at the docs that GitHub has um, for more information. One of the great things about GitHub, GitHub Actions, if you're already using GitHub for a repository, is that they are defined inside of your repository, right? So you don't need to go uh, to a third party service um, and tie in your GitHub repository uh, and make sure it's all hooked up and working and, and worry about authentication and permissions. It's already inside of GitHub, right? Uh, so that's one advantage. So if you're using GitHub, then you can make use of GitHub Actions very easily. There are other CI, CD systems out there that are free, paid, et cetera, that you can go to, um, even if you're using GitHub for your repository or if you're not using GitHub at all, right? Um, I won't cover those today. Uh, I'm gonna focus on GitHub because it's something that is very popular in especially the open source communities. Um, and it's something that everybody has pretty easy access to and a lot of knowledge about. And so that's why I focus this talk around. But just know that there are, are the, there are other ones out there. So let's get into how you can use them. So in this talk, I prepared a very simple repository, right? And so this is a link from the, the YWIT website page. And in this repository, I've created a Python package, right? So it's very, very simple. All it does is it has basically one function that will get the next event date for YWIT and return the difference between that date and the current time. And then it'll, uh, if, it'll if you're using the CLI, it'll just print it out and say, hey, there's, uh, you know, two months and three days, four hours until the next YWIT event starts, right? Uh, it's, it's very simple. And we'll, go, we'll look at the code briefly, but mostly I want to focus on all the tasks around uh, making that code work well, right? And work well in terms of doing all the, the things around kind of managing a package.
So this is that repository. Uh, and feel free to clone this um, and, and use as a starting point for your own projects. Uh, if you have you know similar things, uh, this is using Python, but it applies to you know every language. Um, there's nothing nothing inherently Python about this particular workshop. Um, so go over a couple of the the important things here. So in the repository, there's this GitHub dot GitHub slash workflows directory, and in this directory are any any actions that we want to perform, right? So you can name these files whatever you like. Um, so for example, I have a build action here. Um, and if you go into the definition, this is a, a YAML file. So it's plain text um, structured with normal YAML rules. Uh, so we so the name of this is build. It doesn't have to match the file name, but it can. Uh, so this is the build action. It will be done every time somebody pushes uh, to this repository. And then it defines the jobs that are going to get done. In, in this case, I have one job build uh, with several steps in this case. Um, the runs on Ubuntu latest is uh, these actions are performed on Docker containers. Uh, that GitHub hosts. Um, and so that's telling it, uh, hey, you know, just use the Ubuntu latest, which is one of the available Docker containers that they have pre-built um, and just run all the commands I'm going to tell you on that, right? So it, it brings up the Docker container and then starts running through these steps. The first step I have here is I, I there's, there's certain build tools I need installed in the environment to make the rest of my stuff work, right? So I'm using Poetry, um, which is a, a, a Python uh, environment and, and package manager um, to help you build and, and, and manage a virtual environment for your Python library. So I'm just going to download that uh, and install it. And then I have a couple other steps here. So step two, uh, it, this is the entire step. It just says uses action slash checkout v2. So there's inside of your action, you can use other actions, right? So actions slash checkout is a, uh, an action provided by GitHub. All, all it does is it, it uh, does a git clone of your repository um, at the commit number that you're, that this is working on and uh, plops it in the current working directory. Right? And so, so you can, you can start working with it later. I have another one here, action set up Python v2. So this is going to set, the system version of Python that it's, it's going to use as 3.7, which is the minimum version for this particular package. And then here I have, uh, I'm going to use the poetry tool that we installed in a previous step to install all of the, the requirements needed for this package. So uh, we can look at that later, but th there's a, you know, be a set of dependencies, whether this is Python or Node.js or, or whatever, you have a set of other libraries that you depend on for yours. Uh, so I'm installing those here. Next we have, uh, it's actually going to go do the build. Actually, as part of the build, it's going to, it's going to run the unit tests I have. And then it, it's going to, assuming those pass, it's going to build the, the package, so in this case, a, a wheel file and a tar GC file for, uh, to, for uploading to PyPI later. Um, so if that's passed, we are going to upload our code coverage to CodeCove, which is a, a third-party website that allows you to browse uh, your code coverage on each file and, and produces some nice graphs and, and things. So, so if you're using some, you know, some external services, um, it's they a lot of them do offer github actions integration right and so we're using they have their own code cove action um, and it, you just take a couple settings uh, that they outline in their documentation put it in here and and you're good to go and finally um, the last step here is uh, to publish our python package to pypi um, but this one i want to be conditional right so i have this if statement so we don't necessarily want to publish a new version of the package on every push. Um, maybe you do, I, you know, but probably not, right? Because a lot of pushes are going to be 
minor and you don't necessarily want to rev the version number every time which PyPI requires right so in this case um, it says if starts with github event ref refs tags right well, what does that mean so on github you can tag a particular commit and it, uh, so you tag it with version 1.2 right and the next and then you push 10 more times and then you say okay this is 1.3 right and so you kind of um, for your user's sake, you give them uh, meaningful tags and say, okay, well, at this version, here's the, you know, the 10 commits that have gone in, right? And, and maybe you maybe you decide you release weekly or you just release whenever there's significant new functionality or whatever, but you want to tag that in GitHub. And we'll go through an example of that later. If you do that, then this, this action will run um, and it's going to automatically publish to PyPI uh and um we'll see an example of that where basically all you have to, just by tagging a commit in github um suddenly the new version is available on pypi um so that's what the the build action looks like this is the most complicated one because it does the most things um but it, you know relative it was just 38 lines of yaml is all, you know all you have to write um to have all those things actually work um so GitHub actions are very powerful and allow you to do many, many things and uh, just basically move on with your life after you've, after you've gotten it working once, you don't have to uh, remember to do these things, which is nice. So before we go on, let's, let's take a look at some of the runs, right? So I, this repository, I've, I've made a bunch of commits and uh, the actions have run a bunch of times. So if you go to the actions tab at the top, what you see is all of the, here's the, the 13 times the various workflows have run, right? And so what do you see? You see the, the this is the commit name um, and you see the, the action that runs. So this is the docs action. This is the build action we were looking at before. Right? So you can see for the same exact commit, um, multiple actions ran, which is fine. And they'll, uh, you know, they'll run in parallel and, uh, you can you can do multiple things uh, without them without them even being in the same file. We can look at the docs file later. Uh, but here's the uh, uh, what it looks like if you click on one of these, you will see. So okay, this run are, there are no artifacts, no annotations. Those are more advanced things that we won't get into. But for the build. Uh, you can see it took a series of steps here, right? So setup job is is it um, uh, looking at all of the pre prerequisites it needs and setting up the um, the Docker container, and then you can see it st start going through um, all of the 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 steps that we had to find, right? So install build tools. Um, you, you can look at the console output. This will be especially important if your job fails, right? So this is a successful run. Um, there are no problems to look at here. We've got the green check mark, but if we had a failure of a job uh, like this one, for example, um, so here's so process completed with Xcode one. Okay, well, that doesn't tell us much, but it, you would see some things there depending on what happens, right? So um, if you open it up, it's gonna open it up right to the failure. And in this case, uh, okay, so it tried, so I was I was doing something and it ended up running the the build on a on a branch where this file doesn't exist, um, and so it, it it failed and that's fine I I didn't need to worry about that, um, but you know you'll be able to see all your failures and successes if by going to the action tab um, you can see fail you can limit it to you know if I only care about the build steps or the docs steps, um, you can limit it there. So let's take a look at uh, what what does the docs uh, step look like, right? Let's go back to our uh, workflow file and the docs. And so, okay, what does the docs do? The docs is a little bit simpler in this case. Um, only when we push to the main branch do we want to build the docs, right? So if, if we're uh, pushing to other branches, you know, creating feature branches. Uh, we don't necessarily want to update the the docs because there's all, at least the way I've designed it here. There's only one docs 
um, website, right? One docs output, um, one way, you know, one. So we only want to see the head of line, the the main code line, right? And so that's that's what this limiting does here. Uh, you can use these sorts of rules um, in in any action, and so the docs is, uh, needs it for that for that reason. Again, uh, this looks very familiar. We're going to run on Ubuntu latest. We're going to install our build tools, check out our repository, uh, make sure it's using 3.7, install uh, any dependencies, including, in this case, uh, Sphinx, which is the uh, a very common uh, package for creating Python docs. And so we're going to install that. And then we're actually going to build the docs. We're going to do poetry run and then Sphinx build. We tell it we want to make HTML docs as opposed to PDF or some other sort. The docs directory is what we want to build. And then the output is going to go and build slash HTML. Uh, and then after that's done running, so now all the docs are in build slash HTML, uh, uh, we're going to publish them to a GitHub pages uh, site. So GitHub has another facility called GitHub pages, which allows you to host your repository content as uh, as a web page, right? So you can use this either if you're making, let's say you're making a website, just some static site, and you want to just check in the HTML files and CSS files directly into a GitHub repository, GitHub can just host that for you automatically. Or in this case, uh, we want to just host a, a part of our repository, right? Just the docs. We don't need you know the, the .py files you know, the browsers don't know how to display those very intelligently, but we just want to host the generated docs. Um, and so this action from James Ives uh, does that for us. Basically, it takes, you you tell it which folder to build HTML. Um, it's going to put all of the contents of this onto the GH pages branch. Um, and then as soon as that's done, it, it'll be automatically published by GitHub to a, uh, to a website, right? And if you don't have that turned on, you have to go to your your uh, repository settings. There will be GitHub Pages, and so you can host your docs uh, by setting setting this up. So I have it set such that I'm going to do it only from the GH Pages branch, and it'll be just the root directory. But you could also have a special slash docs directory. So if you wanted to. Uh, and, and the reason I'm, I'm doing this it this way is because my docs are generated. If your docs were just static, um, then maybe you have just your main branch with a docs directory. And so you'd set that up um, like this, and it, it would it would just host that one directory at this web address. But as it, as it stands, since I'm generating a bunch of files and not actually checking them in, um, then it, it's going to, but I'm, I'm why well, I'm checking them, and I'm sorry, but I'm checking them in as part of my GitHub action. Every time I commit to the main branch, it goes to the GitHub pages branch. And so I'm just going to serve the whole route uh, there. And you can see that, so my, my docs are here. Um, this is, you know, this was automatically hosted by GitHub, and they're very, very simple. I just put the one sentence in here. Um, but you can, you can have these be as complicated as you want. Uh, so this was, you know, using using Sphinx, uh, using a, a the, the read the docs theme, but otherwise it really wasn't customized in any way. And there's lots and lots of customization you can get into with Sphinx. So if we go look at, so how did those? Let's let's take a, a deeper dive. So if I go back to the docs source, so I have a source directory called docs, and Sphinx requires uh, at least two things so that there's a, a make file um, that it needs and it, and it generated this for me and then a conf file and again it generated most of this for me and all I had to do was fill in what's the project name what's the author name what's the copyright year what's the first number right um, and when you do all that it knows is so it puts the copyright here the author name you know the uh, puts the the project name in several places etc right uh, and then everything else is uh, written, you know, in this case, I just have one page index.rst. So it's written using restructured text. Now, if you're not familiar with that, um, 
it's it's similar to Markdown if you've seen that before, um, but uh, it looks a little bit different. We can look at it here. So instead of in Markdown, you might say you know hash and then put the the word you want for heading number one in restructured text. You just put the word and then you underline it, um, and then it parses that and knows okay this is a heading. And there's lots of information out there about restructured text. GitHub is good about, uh, so you can see that GitHub knows how to render restructured text just like it would mark down. So when I'm looking at this page, I see how it would look as if I were viewing it here. So my docs action takes the source directory um, and builds it using Sphinx and then publishes it to the GH pages branch. Uh, and then once that's done, you know, immediately it's uh, published on on this this link here, which is the your organization name dot github dot io slash your repository name. And so if we're looking at the actual action, we see, OK, well, it's doing all the same setup steps. Uh, here's the publish docs or excuse me, the build docs step. Right, we're just going to do the Sphinx build. It does everything Sphinx needs to do. Here's the published docs from James Ives, and he has uh, a lot of good, good information listed here for you. So if you get stuck or if something's breaking, um, you know, please go read uh, what, what he has to say. Um, but a lot of good work here to just get, get everything over to that GH Pages branch uh, and get it all cleaned up right. And so if we actually go look at the GH Pages branch, so you'll see here that the, the root of this is just the built output of my docs. Um, it doesn't include any of the source files or anything outside of the, the doc stuff. It's just uh, the docs here. Um, and so that uh, that's, that's how this site is being served. It's basically, this is the root. Here's an index.html. And then we see this site. Let's talk a little bit about the next thing, pull requests. So uh, you can see now that a, a pull request has popped up. And as the repository owner, that is somebody else telling me, hey, I have a, a piece of code I'd like to add to your repository. Uh, will you take a look at it um, and see if it's all right and merge it in if you agree, right? Uh, so how can actions help us with pull requests? Well, it, one, one way is that you want to check that the code that's coming in doesn't uh, break your existing code. It doesn't violate any of the norms you have for your repository because you want to keep everything looking the same so that people can collaborate together easy, more easily, right? So let's go take a look at that pull request. So we click on the button. Um, well, actually, I, I want to go in. Oh, right. I'm, excuse me. Uh, so I created a new branch called my pull request, and I want to merge it into the main branch, right? Um, so let's create that pull request now. So this will uh, bring up a new page showing pull requests. And so I didn't provide any description. Um, and we can see that there are, there's this, here's the GitHub actions uh, report, right? So, okay, a bunch of stuff just happened. Oh, so one thing is the CodeCov report. So CodeCov was, I mentioned before, uh, a site for tracking code coverage. So one of the features that it adds is it will look at incoming pull requests and say, okay, well, what, what effect does this addition have on the test coverage of the library, right? And so in, without looking at what, what this has changed, the report is telling me, hey, you know, the coverage is going to increase by 1.63%. Awesome. You know, our coverage is a little bit low. That's That sounds great, right? Um, uh, and so you, you may want to know, let's say a, a request is coming in and it's going to decrease the coverage by 30%, right? Because they, they've added a whole new module uh, of functionality, which we really appreciate, but they didn't add any testing, right? So one of the things in order to 
maintain good code quality, make sure you're not shipping bugs, is you should always have tests. If you don't test something, you don't know if it's working, right? Um, now, while code coverage is a helpful tool, and your goal is to get a, you know, you know that if you have a higher percentage, you are touching more things in your automated testing. It's not, it's not an absolute, right? So reaching 100 percent should not necessarily be a requirement of yours. Um, this is something that takes a little finesse, um, but it is a good tool to have in your tool belt. It is a good thing to look at, and so I have Code Cove. Um, uh, integrated here and the way it was integrated was it was very very easy and just that we pushed a coverage report to it um, so it analyzes that and, and it gives back uh, reports in our pull requests and so that ran automatically uh, as soon as the pull request came in and so everything else has passed if we look at show all checks so it's going to do the the build push uh, we look at the details here. It's going to take us over to okay. Well, here's here's everything it ran, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So build package was probably one of the, you know. So we could see here's okay. So here's where it's doing the generating the um, code coverage uh, by running the unit tests. Uh, everything's looking pretty good, right? So we can we can uh, we can go through yeah the, the review dog, which is another thing that was part of our build thing. Or it was was oh look so so here we see this change is going to produce some unreachable code so this is just a warning it didn't fail um, but on so line 19 column four and so it's gonna if we click on that here's this is the the commit number that's coming in and the file and so we see line 19 column four uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Oh, look, line 18, somebody accidentally put in a return, right? So so if you're going to return right after this code is run, then nothing after it can be run, right? And so uh, we're not going to end up printing out either one of these messages, which is probably not what was intended. You know, perhaps perhaps they were doing it for testing reasons. We forgot to take it back out. Um, we're not sure. But now looking, at, looking through this, we're just going to say, uh, you know what, maybe can we we fix that, right? So we're going to go uh, and make a comment and say, you know, what's this about? And I'll just add that single comment there. And so this winter will get an email and they'll say, oh, you know, sorry, I probably didn't mean to add that. Um, and they'll they'll push another uh, uh, change to to remove it, and then we will be able to uh, merge their commit request, right? Um, so the the idea here is that the actions can help you uh, look at pull requests. You know, this is a very simple one. I I, I purposefully introduced something bad, uh, but let's say you're looking at a pull request and it's 300 lines long. Well, maybe. You want to know: Does it pass the unit test? Does it decrease code coverage? Does it produce any sort of linting errors, like unreachable code or or other things that might be bad? If it does, uh, you have the tools have already told you: Hey, go look in these spots um, before you even had to to comb through the whole thing, and that can be very valuable. So now I want to look at one final thing. So this repository contains a Python package, uh, which I mentioned before, just tells us you know, how long is it until the YWID event, right? And so I've published this package on PyPI. It's called YWID Event Countdown, right? The version is 2020.11. That's the current live version. And if you uh, want, you can install that that package and uh, run it and it'll tell you, hey, it, you know, there's, there's X amount of time left until the YWID event. What happens when I want to publish the next version, right? So let's uh, make a small change to our repository. And we'll do it right in GitHub to make it easy to see. But usually you might do this inside of your code editor, right? And so in this case, I want to, I'm going to say that the, the version number is now uh, dot one. So 
so 2020 November dot one. So the dot one release after the first one. And I'm going to say um, update the version number. Right. Let, and you can pretend like um, a bunch of other changes were made either in this commit or in prior commits where you will want to publish a new version of this package. Right. So I've updated the version number. Uh, let's go see. And I committed that. And you can see that the, the actions are running. Um, so the build is happening. We can actually see this in action this time, so just the history. So if you if you actually go to the screen while it's happening, you can watch the the console output, which will give you a good idea of both how long it takes and you know if if anything's if everything's happening the way you think it is, uh, which is pretty neat. So you can see it's it's uh, doing what it needs to do to to set up the uh, Docker container at the moment. Here we are actually uh, installing all the requirements for a package just before we're going to build it. And I'm just letting this run uh, so that we can, you know, so you can get a idea, good idea of how it works. This is not really any different than, than the manual steps you take on your own computer. Um, so when you're designing your actions, you probably want to think about, okay, well, you know, when I, I have to do this, 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 and this to my code uh, in order to build and test it, right? Um, and then you just kind of write those down in the YAML file one at a time and GitHub will do those on, on its computers. Um, so we're done. It said everything is passed. So no problems there. And now we'll talk about, so there's a feature in GitHub, so releases and tagging. Um, and so they're, they're very related. Um, well, let's create a new release, right? Because when you release, uh, uh, you'll, you'll get this screen releases and tags and actually i want to if you went to tags there, there's nothing is you, you need to, to create a release right so okay fine so let's just tag uh and we want to call it 2020.11.1 and that'll be the tag name it can be whatever you want and have to be the same uh what, what's the title this is um workshop demo release and this is the second release the first one done live okay um, and you can you can even attach um, extra binaries uh, to it if so if you were building a, a package um, outside of github actions um, this is and not necessarily publishing it to, for example, PyPI. Maybe you just wanted to actually host the binaries here. That's that's where you do it here. Um, but let's go ahead and publish this release, All right? And so what does that do? Uh, so we get the releases page. Here's our title or description. Um, it automatically gives us the these attachments for our source code. So this is the source code at that moment in time. Um, and you can see here's the release tag and the release commit number. All right, so we go to the we can click on the tag and so we can give this link to anybody um, and it will always be this this exact set of source code right and so that's what a tag is useful for but we can see that there is actually so this little icon here means an action is running right so we didn't make any commits but we did make uh, do a tag and if you remember back when i was showing the build file there's that one said step that said if uh, yada yada uh, equals tags, right? And so that's what's happening here. We can see the 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 tag kind of acts like a branch, and the the actual action of tagging something acts a bit like a push to that branch. Um, and so our our workflow is running. And so if we go check in on its status, uh, so it's a, halfway done. We're installing our, our Python requirements, building our package. Um, uploading our, our coverage data. And here's uh, th this action here is the one that's never run before, right? And so you can see that that that, that was always skipped in the last one. So let's take a, a real quick look at it. So this is the publish to PyPI step. Um, and if we look here, it, it, uh, 
in the last one, we generated these dist slash, you know, yada, 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 wheel file and dist slash targz file. And so we're going to run the, the uh, poetry publish command, and it's going to put those on PyPI for us, right? As a new version, you can see that it uploaded both and we can view it here, right? So if we look at PyPI, we say, hey, look, uh, the newest version is 2020.11.1, was released less than a minute ago, right? Uh, and we could go to release history. Here was the first one, here's the current one. Um, so just the act of tagging a particular release uh, published the package to PyPI for us, and we don't really have to worry about it. Um, we can do everything through, through GitHub, um, because we've automated it. And what, what th this relied on us introducing the, uh, the PyPI uh, uh, secret key into our repository. And so I actually have one for CodeCov and one for PyPI in here. When you, typically when you're integrating with a third party service, this is what you'll end up doing. You don't wanna put these secrets inside of your YAML files because the YAML files are checked in the repository and anybody can see those, right? We've been looking at them during this talk, um, but I certainly don't want, and you won't want anybody to see the uh, secrets, right? And so GitHub has this section in settings secrets where you can add uh, secrets that will never be shown. I can't even, you know, I uploaded these, I have full permissions to the repository and I still can't ever see these again. Right, it's you put them in there, and GitHub uses them. You, you reference them in your actions, but you can never see them. Nobody can, um, which is, you know, a good thing. Um, if you need to create a new one, you just create a new repository secret. You give it a name. It doesn't matter what it's called, and sorry, it doesn't matter if it's capital, lowercase, whatever the name is. Right, and um, it's usually given to you by the third-party service. They'll say, "Hey, you know, add this secret to your to your GitHub account." Here, we're just creating a custom one, which is fine as well. And so, I can add that, and then inside of uh, one of my workflows, for example, if uh, in the build, if I wanted to reference my secret, um, I would say something like this: "I have dollar sign." Uh, curly brace, curly brace, secrets dot, and I would say my secret, curly brace, curly brace, right? And that would, at build time, insert whatever the value of the secret was uh, into the workflow um, in a in such a way that it's, um, it's not revealed to anybody who's looking through the repository, but it still is, uh, is able to be used. Um, and so that's how that worked. Uh, I and on PyPI you get your secrets by I think you go to your account settings. Uh, actually, sorry, and down you scroll down, and you make uh, new API tokens, right? So you can see I have an AP, I made an API token for specifically for this uh, project in PyPI. And again, it will never be shown again once you've created on PyPI. So if you ever have to reset it, you're going to have to log back into both places and make sure you've you've reset it. And that's the end of uh, this workshop. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that GitHub Actions are valuable, that you might want to use them for your repositories, and even uh, shown you some of the power of the things they can do. I've, I've only scratched the surface here. There are many, many pre-prepared actions, uh, and there are many that you can write your own, right? So you don't necessarily have to be a wizard with writing actions. There's lots of people out there writing them that are generic that you can use in your own repositories. Um, but if you have specific things you want to do, uh, then you can write your own too, and you can even publish your own for other people to use. Um, you know, to, So today I've shown you four basic ones. One is for building and testing. One is for publishing documents. Uh, one is for verifying pull requests. And one was for publishing to a third-party repository. And all of that is done and handled just by your normal 
Git workflows where you do a commit and a push and a tagging releases. Out, and you don't need to worry about it. Uh, you don't need to do any other button pushing. And once you start growing your projects, it becomes invaluable to that these things are automated. Um, you don't want to forget to do something. You don't want two people to do things different ways. Um, so if you automate it and you stick it into the one common tool you're using, you'll get a lot of value out of the automation. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this talk. Um, feel, please feel free to clone the repository, um, play with it yourself, uh, look at how it's implemented, start testing on your own. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. Use the email ng-ywit-questions at netup.com, and I will answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your time.